Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our uh, East Asian Institute Distinguished Public Lecture on a topic which is very close to my heart. 25 years after the Asia financial crisis, what have we learned? Um, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Hoi Kaur, who I will introduce formally in a moment, to, have, to be the speaker, because uh, he's the man with great experience in the topic. Uh, as many of you know, the uh, Asia financial crisis 25 years ago was a, a, a dramatic, or should I say, a traumatic time for East Asia, for countries that had been very successful in development, and basically were caught up in a, in a sudden stop of capital flows, which uh, 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 through contagions, it started in Thailand, through contagions went to Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Korea, and but really the, 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 the region and in the end, the rest of the world. So really a traumatic experience, but also a, uh, a galvanizing experience to some extent, because a lot of reforms came out during the crisis that had to happen uh, because to fight a crisis. But later on, a whole range of reforms in the international financial architecture in uh, the thinking about capital flows, the thinking about exchange rate, which in the end brought uh, Asia on, uh, in my view, on a on, on a very sustainable and fast track growth uh, after the financial crisis. Of course, that is still debated as we speak. It is still debated. Among others, uh, uh, in that debate is our speaker of the day, Dr. Ho E. Kaur. He oversees the uh, macroeconomic and financial surveillance work of AMRO, the uh, ASEAN Plus Three macroeconomic research office, which is, of course, the office that serves the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization uh, um, uh, arrangement of, of uh, a regional, a regional exchange rate, uh, excuse me, a reserve arrangement that uh, I'm sure Dr. Ho Yi will, will refer to in his speech. Uh, it's uh, AMRO comprised of 10 member countries of, the, uh, uh, of ASEAN and China, including Hong Kong and Japan and South Korea. Dr. Hoi Kaur is, has a very distinguished career. He has been uh, in the region and beyond for a very long time and has a, a tremendous experience and tremendous service uh, for uh, uh, civil service in Singapore and internationally. He started his career in, in the IMF, then came back to Singapore and uh, was at the monetary authorities where he uh, was the assistant managing director of uh, uh, the monetary authorities from 2001 to 2009. He was the, uh, uh, then went back to the IMF and was the deputy director of the Asia and Pacific Department at the International Monetary Fund uh, yeah. until he joined AMRO. Uh, Dr. Kaur worked on, on, on many countries. I, I looked through his publications list that I uh, looked up and, and he worked from countries such as Mexico, uh, China, he and I worked on China together in the early 90s when China was full of reforms uh, uh, and Malaysia and many other Asian countries. Uh, Dr. Kaur holds his PhD from Princeton University. Delighted to have Dr. Hoi Kaur here. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. You can do that during the lecture and I will uh, 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 moderate uh, the, the question and answer session afterwards. Dr. Kaur, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bert. Uh, like you, I think this uh, Asian financial crisis is an event that is very close to my heart. Uh, I arrived in Singapore in 1996, actually, uh, and was head of the economics department at that time when the crisis broke. And it's because of the Asian financial crisis that I ended up staying in Singapore for the next 12 years uh, before I left for Abu Dhabi and then went back to IMF and then came back here as a chief economist for AMRO. Um, so uh, this uh, particular lecture is very timely because uh, you know we had just uh, prepared a, uh, this book here, uh, From Trauma to Triumph, uh, Rising from the Ashes of the Asian Financial Crisis. Uh, we had plan plan this book uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of AMRO uh, back in 2019 or even 2018. And then uh, because of COVID, uh, we got, you know, the whole schedule was uh, delayed and uh, but it came out uh, at the end of uh, last year, 
just in time for the celebration of our 10th anniversary in December. And, but we had a soft launch then. And then in May, we had the hard copy that came out. So as it turns out, uh, it was, you know, it helps to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the uh, Asian financial crisis. And the reason we, we did that is because uh, it's because of the Asian financial crisis that EMRO was established. Uh, so, you know, we want uh, to, co to commemorate this, uh, <clears throat> Uh, our ten, our existence by putting up a book to uh, to basically uh, you know uh, uh, keep for public for posterity you know what what a record of for posterity what happened during the Asian financial crisis and what we have learned uh, thus far. So the book has three parts. Uh, if I can, I'll just talk briefly about the book. Uh, uh, the first part is basically a series of interviews with policymakers uh, who were present during the crisis. You know? And the second part is a series of uh, studies by you know, eminent academics about for each of the countries. And then the third part is talking about financial, uh, financial cooperation you know, and, and, and the developments of the regional financial institutions. So the first part is, is, is what is, uh, different, I guess, distinguish the book from other others or on the Asian financial crisis. Because when you when you read that part, you'll find out that you know, despite the fact that it's been 25 years, the memories are still very vivid. And many of the participants at that time, you know, uh, you know will recall with great detail what happened then. So this helps to bring the, the crisis back to life again, in some sense. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a good way, you know, to basically uh, record what happened uh, for posterity. Because time, as time passes, I think the newer generation has very little memories of what happened. In fact, uh, in Emro, most of my younger colleagues, uh, you know, they basically, you know, don't know very much about uh, the crisis itself. But for those of us who lived through it, uh, it's a very traumatic experience. And I think most of us still remember what happened. <clears throat> so that's uh, for background. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so, so this is basically an outline of the presentation. I'll first start with the causes of the crisis and the lessons that came out of it. And then I'll move on to talk about the changes in the policy and regulatory framework at the individual country level, and then at the national and international level. And I'll end with, maybe this, uh, a, a short brief discussion of the new risks and challenges facing the region and what change, what directions you know uh, it implies in terms of policy changes <laughs> so many of you will remember you know all these uh, headlines uh, back in 1997 or 1998 uh, you know, IMF at that time was stand for I am fired or <laughs> uh, so it was a very uh, a traumatic uh, period for you know, countries that were hit uh, by the, by the uh, crisis. Uh, as you can see, the headlines are quite uh, dramatic. Uh, Thai stocks stumble as, as bark slides the weakest in a decade. You know? Or the floating of the rupiah, you know, and how the, uh, the, uh, the President Suharto was, you know, had to resign. Uh, and in Korea, I think the memory remains very strong uh, until several years ago, whenever you visit Korea, uh, you know, they refer this as the IMF crisis. Mm. Um, so it was a very uh, difficult time for most of the region. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, lost their savings and there were even people who committed suicide. Businesses went bust uh, and governments got overthrown. Uh, so and until today, I think the IMF stigma is still there. Uh, it's slowly fading away. Uh, I think a big breakthrough took place in 2018 when the IMF held its uh, <clears throat> um, annual meeting in Bali. You know? um, it was just before that, uh, the IMF MD wanted to visit uh, Jakarta and immediately there were demonstrations in the street. <laughs> So they had to, to uh, give the, you know, an issue and uh, 
a press release that you know the IMF uh, is not coming to lend money to uh, Indonesia, uh, but to, to have some discussion. So, but they managed to host the meeting in 2018, and I, I thought there was a breakthrough in terms of relation between you know Indonesia and the IMF. <clears throat> But because of the stigma, uh, that was the reason why uh, EMRO and, uh, was, was set up also. Okay, so what was the cause of the uh, crisis? Uh, as you can see from these charts here, uh, the region was, had relatively strong fundamentals leading up to the crisis. If you look at growth, they were averaging between 7.5% to 10%, you know, averaging about 8 9 percent, uh, very strong growth, and the World Bank had came up with a new report called the East Asian Miracle, celebrating the success of the region. And you look at consumer prices, you know, the average, they are, they are low to moderate, you know, they are, uh, in the, this line here is for the Philippines and they were trending downwards. So inflation was relatively low and moderate, uh, and if you look at current account, they range between 4 to 8 percent. Uh, the highest being for the Thailand, which is around 8%. But for the rest of the, of the economies in the region, it was around 4%. So, you know, it's re relatively moderate. Uh, and if you look at the fiscal, this is the, the debt, the chart on the, on the debt to GDP ratio. But if you look at the fiscal balance, they're mostly in surplus, uh, small surplus. So, you know, when the shock happened, it was, it was a real <laughs> shock to the whole uh, region. Everybody was celebrating the success of the region, and all of a sudden, they had this massive uh, 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 shock. Uh, and you know, most people are very bitter, and you know, they, and of course, the shock took place uh, because of speculative attack, as, as we all know, uh, on the uh, Thai bar. <clears throat> so let me move on. Uh, Okay, so what are the causes of this uh, Asian financial crisis? Uh, the, these are the, the, the commonly cited causes of the crisis in you know, excessive lending and borrowing. You know? uh, so that's part of the original same problem that emerging markets are unable to borrow in their own currency. And so they're the borrowing in, in foreign currency. Uh, and because uh, at that, uh, the, the, lo the external loans tend to be cheaper, a lot of uh, you know corporates borrow in, in uh, uh, external loan, uh, and at that time also their currency tends to be packed to the U.S. dollar, or you know uh, relatively uh, in one form or another tight. You know, so that results there's sort of a, a moral hazard issue because the, the corporate assume that the the exchange will remain relatively stable, and so. For them, borrowing externally makes a lot of sense because it's much cheaper. But that leads to a double mismatch problem where you, know, you have a currency mismatch between the currency of, uh, of the loan and the revenue that they, they, they derive from the, from the investment. And there's also a maturity mismatch uh, because a lot of these loans were used for you know, projects which have much longer uh, gestation period. Uh, so that leads to the double mismatch, uh, which has been identified as one of the causes of the crisis. Um, the other, the other cause is uh, that the policy and regulatory framework in the region had become outdated, and I will get into that a bit later. Uh, most of them, as I mentioned, had packed exchange rate, and regulatory framework was relatively simple. They are basically, uh, you know, you uh, compliance based. And the only ratio, I think ratio that was at that time was the capital adequacy ratio, which was set at relatively uh, low level at, at that time. And then there were, of course, the massive uh, speculative attacks by macro hedge funds. Uh, you know, we heard, we know about the, the, the famous Soros uh, uh, hedge funds. And they were, you know, going around looking for uh, vulnerable currencies and you know, Thailand seems to stand out at that time. Uh, they were already having uh, financial issues even before that. Uh, some of the finance company and property company you know, were having run into problems. 
so it became a, a target for the hedge funds. And along with that, of course, uh, once the hedge funds begins to attack and the currency begins to weaken, you have the, the herding behavior by other investors you know, who, who take the, the weakness of the, of, of the currency as a sign that you know, the currency is weak. Uh, so that leads to this herding behavior where, you know, uh, the, and which is what actually the macro hedge fund was trying to do uh, to precipitate, you know, uh, a massive uh, run on the currency. And there of, and a lot of people blame this crisis also on poor corporate governance, particularly corruption, cronyism, and nepotism. But we know that this, uh, you know, uh, uh, Factors have been around for a long time, even leading up to the crisis. Uh, but the crisis sort of revealed uh, many of these issues, and that's been blamed also for the uh, for the crisis. I guess one can argue that you know it's because of cronyism that in, which leads to excessive borrowing by the corporate sector, and many of the projects that were you know uh, financed were also you know poor, had poor returns and were unable to you know service a loan. So there's some some aspect of this poor corporate governance that I think is, is quite valid. Uh, and finally, uh, and in my view, the systemic uh, cause of this crisis was the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in 1991, which led to financial liberalization and the globalization of finance. Um, Let me start with the last one, which is the globalization, the, the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. If you look at the chart uh, on the left, uh, you can see that uh, capital inflows into the region, right? Back in the 70s, it was relatively quite small, but it begins to uh, spike up, uh, you know, uh, leading up to the Asian financial crisis. And then, it, and then there was a massive uh, uh, reversal, uh, you know, when the crisis hit. And this was like over hundred billion dollars of, uh, of, of, of flows, you know, that, that reverse itself. And of course that is a big shock to the system. And it's not surprising that it led to, you know, the currency uh, 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 crash and stock market uh, collapse uh, and you know, give rise to a run on, on the currency. <clears throat> Similarly, on the right side, you see, you know, a similar uh, profile, uh, the right, the, you know, the, 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 the massive inflow into Korea leading up to the currency and the reversal. Um, and so this, this, this happened because of the liberalization of capital markets and the financial system back in the, in the 70s. And it's been sort of building up over time, you know, leading up to the, uh, the, the crisis. Uh, if you look at the uh, charts on the on the right side, right, you see that the frequency of crisis, uh, you know, uh, increases over time, right, from the 1970s, when the Bretton Woods broke down, uh, you can see that, you know, the crisis became more and more frequent uh, until it peaked around the Asian financial crisis, and since then it's sort of uh, been, been a decline. Uh, until the, the global financial crisis, which is this bar here. You know? uh, since then, there have been outbreaks, uh, mostly currency crisis. Uh, <clears throat> and on the, on the left-hand side, uh, these are the major crises you know, along the way. The oil crisis back in the 70s, leading up to the Latin American crisis. The oil crisis, interesting because uh, I, it, it reflects the, you know, the easy monetary policy partly the expansionary policy in the US. Uh, and that led to you know, high oil prices and the need to recycle the, the, the petrol dollars, as they call it, which were deposited you know, in New York and London. So that was the, the, the reason for the buildup in the Latin American crisis, uh, because a lot of this uh, excess dollar so were recycled into Latin America, uh, which came to a head back you know, in 1982 and you know, led to uh, fit the current account crisis basically uh, in many of these Latin American countries. And then we have the tequila crisis in 1994 uh, leading up to the Asian financial crisis. You know? 
So th th there's a you know uh, a series of crises that took place after the the breakdown of the bread and wood system, uh, which was uh, replaced by a floating exchange rate system with the U.S. dollar as the dominant currency and the, and the numeraire basically against which most other currencies float, right? And that was a, a you know a, a shock or, or change in, in the uh, international monetary system, which you know. Let, gave rise to a lot of un, you know, unforeseen uh, uh, consequences. So as you can see, the, the impact of the crisis on the region was pretty uh, severe. The currencies depreciated very sharply. Uh, the red line here is Indonesia. Uh, and you know, it fell by almost 80% of its value. Um, and the other currencies depreciated by almost 40%. Uh, so it's a very sharp devaluation. So you can imagine if they borrow in foreign currency in US dollar in particularly, you know, uh, they will completely be ins insolvent because they, they cannot uh, meet the, the liability, the obligation to service the debt. And the stock market also collapsed, uh, as we can see because the corporate, uh, you know, to the big uh, balance sheet was damaged. And so many of them also uh, stock market crash uh, and took a while before they recover fully. And on the right hand side, you see the, the, the real GDP, uh, the, 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 the most severe one is Thailand and Indonesia. Uh, in, and Philippines was relatively unaffected because it has just came out of a, a uh, balance of payment crisis in the 80s. And so it, it, it didn't borrow as much as the other economies did uh, leading up to the crisis. So as a result, it was, it was, it was relatively unscathed uh, compared to the other uh, uh, economies in the region. But all the other economies took a big hit in terms of the GDP growth. Uh, and, and you can see from this chart, uh, uh, this is the trend output line. Uh, because of the crash, ma many of them, you know, uh, fell sharply. And although they recover, they, they never actually get back to trend, you know. Uh, but what is important, and not only that, you know, the growth rate also came down. It used to average 8.2% before the crisis, and it came down to about 5.6%. So that's about two and a half percentage point lower than what it used to be uh, before the crisis. Uh, so there was a cost to the, it's called the scarring effect, it, both in terms of the output level as well as the growth rate. Uh, and fortunately, of course, the, the region did manage to recover and grow relatively strongly, although much lower. One, one can argue that the 8.2% was not sustainable in any case, because it, it was uh, based on borrowed uh, money. And so, the 5.6 percent turned out to be much more sustainable, but you know, as I will show later, is you know, it was due to a collapse in the investment. <clears throat> so this chart shows the uh, the credit to GDP gaps, and as you can see, most of the uh, credit GDP gap was relatively low, and it was it, it was only uh, Malaysia and. Thailand, Thailand, you know, GDP ratio was much higher, so it was really borrowing, uh, you know, heavily in order to, you know, uh, for for all kinds of property projects in uh, bank in, in Thailand, particularly in Bangkok, uh, and in the case of Malaysia, there, there was a sharp ramp up in uh, borrowing leading up to the crisis because of many of the mega projects uh, at that time. <clears throat> The, the spike up for, the, for Indonesia is due mostly to the collapse in the GDP, you know, uh, because as you can see, actually the, the, the credit GDP ratio was relatively low, but because of the collapse in the GDP and, and the exchange rate, uh, you know, uh, the, there was a lot of uh, bo foreign borrowing by the corporate uh, and that, you know, shows up as a spike in the uh, debt GDP ratio. <clears throat> But you can see the collapse in, uh, in investment uh, you know, because of the crisis. It used to average around 40% and it went down to about 25%. So there was a massive decline 
in the uh, uh, investment rate to GDP ratio. And of course, again, one can argue that, you know, uh, this was excessive in any case because it was based on, you know, cheap money. And this was a more sustainable level. But it does mean that, you know, uh, growth rate did come off very sharply, as you can see earlier. Uh, you know, the growth rate you know, went from eight and a half percent to or to seven uh, five point six percent. So for each of the, I just go through very quickly. Uh, you know what happened in the the crisis hit economy. Thailand being the first one, they suffered a very sharp uh, you know uh, hit to the uh, growth. And they recovered somewhat, uh, but as you can see, the growth then was 4.9% as against 7.3% uh, before the crisis. And it came down further after the global financial crisis, 37 And most recently, you know, the COVID. Period. So Thailand has been subject to a series of shocks. Um, and, you know, this gap here basically reflects the scarring effect, you know, from, from the crisis. Uh, you can see from this chart here on the right hand side that you know investment collapsed here to about 20 just over 20 percent from a high of 50 percent and the growth recovery was driven by you know a very sharp uh, uh, increase in exports uh, export you know, quite like the region was quite lucky because uh, after the crisis you know the u.s economy was very strong and that helps to uh, drive uh, external demand and exports in the region so most of the region were able to, you know, uh, 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 recover on the basis of very strong export growth uh, to the EU. For Korea, uh, you can see the growth also slowed from almost 9% to 5%. And then it slowed further to 2.8% uh, after the global financial crisis. But what is remarkable about Korea was that it, in this period, most of the growth was driven by capital uh, uh, investment. Whereas uh, after the re reform and restructuring of the tables, a lot of the growth uh, in this period was driven by uh, TFP growth, uh, productivity growth. And that's the reason why actually Korea was able to continue to rise up the value chain. <clears throat> um, so you can see the private investment, you know, uh, went up to very sharply. Uh, and then came down to, to about 26%. So it's a much lower level of investment and the capital, uh, the driver of growth sh shifted from uh, capital accumulation to uh, TFP growth. <clears throat> this is Malaysia, uh, same story. You can see growth before the crisis was almost 10% and it came to five and a half percent and then slowed down further to 5.1%. And in the case of Malaysia, again, it's similar story. The growth was led by manufacturing exports, uh, but Malaysia also uh, benefited from a commodity boom uh, around this time. And since then, you know, uh, the export has uh, come down, but that's mostly because uh, of the shift in uh, final processing exports to China. And most of the countries in, in, in the ASEAN region shifted to production of intermediate inputs that fed in, in, into the, you know, that they were re-exported to China for final processing in the consumer products. <clears throat> so this is uh, Indonesia. Indonesia had a decline from 7.9%, almost 8% to 5.8%. So actually the decline wasn't this, but it took them longer to recover because of the political crisis they went through. There was, you know, uh, it took them uh, a bit longer than the other countries to recover. Uh, so, but in any case, they did recover and the growth was relatively strong, 5.8%. Uh, they also enjoyed a commodity boom at that time, which helped to drive the economy. Uh, and since then, growth has slowed somewhat to 5.1%. Uh, <clears throat> so, what are the key lessons from the crisis? Uh, <clears throat> The key lesson that came out from the crisis is that you know they, they need to be wary of cross-border flows, huh? uh, especially capital flows. Joe Siglick had uh, you know characterized the emerging markets 
as a small boat in an ocean of capital flows, which can easily capsize when there is a big wave. And I think that you know, came through very clearly during the Asian financial crisis. And the lesson that uh, I think the countries took from this was never to allow themselves to fall into crisis again. And the need to build self-insurance in order to build up greater, greater resilience. So they took a number of uh, measures in order to do that. Uh, they, uh, after the Asian financial crisis, foreign borrowings were, were very closely monitored. And in many countries, they required approval of central bank before a corporate you know, is, uh, is able to borrow from abroad. Or even, even the, uh, the government, I think in some countries, you know, they need to get the, the central bank's uh, uh, approval. Mm. So they were very wary of, uh, of uh, borrowing in, in foreign currency, in US dollar particularly. And the other thing that happened is when there's a massive inflow of, uh, of, of um, foreign capital, the central banks try to mop it up so that it doesn't you know, uh, put pressure on the exchange rate because the exchange rate tend to overshoot because the foreign the forest market are relatively thin in most of this economy. So when there's a, you know, a, 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 a big flow, either in or out, it tends to cause the exchange rate to overshoot. So many of them try to smooth out the volatility by intervening in the market. You know? But to do that, then they need to build up a, a reserve. So typically what they'll do is, you know, they'll intervene when there's a massive inflow, uh, which leads to a, a build up in the reserve. And then when it reverses itself, they, they then uh, you know, uh, intervene on the other side to smooth out the outflow. You know? uh, so that has been basically the, uh, the, the practice of most of the uh, central bank in the region. Uh, most of them are, find it difficult to allow the exchange rate to, to flow uh, simply because, you know, as I mentioned, the, the to avoid the excessive volatility and the overshooting of the exchange rate. Many of them are manufacturing exporters. And for them, the, the exchange rate is a, a key uh, price uh, for the exporters. And they came under a lot of pressure if the exchange rate you know, were to appreciate too much. So most of them have a managed float uh, and they try to smooth to maintain that, uh, have more flexibility but not too excessive, and they use the the, uh, the the foreign exchange to as a buffer to smooth out the shocks. But what it means is that the exchange rate, you know, by becoming more flexible, uh, <clears throat> means that they need a, an anchor, and so many of them move towards a, a inflation tar targeting regime to provide the nominal anchor. Uh, so you can no longer fix the exchange rate. You know, so they need more flexibility. Uh, so they then move towards a, a more disciplined monetary policy framework by targeting inflation. And, I, and that took place around, you know, in the early 2000s and has been relatively successful. As you will see, inflation rate has trended down across all the countries in the region and stabilized in, in the low uh, 3%, uh, 2 to 3% uh, until recently. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, as I mentioned before the crisis, most of them, most of the government had relatively conservative fiscal policy. They had run small surpluses, but because of the crisis, you know, and the need to bail out the, uh, the corporate and the banks, uh, they had, you know, the, 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 the debt spike up. So they were very mindful that they need to reconsolidate to build up uh, and re-establish a fiscal discipline. But at the same time, the, most of the countries uh, reformed the regulatory framework uh, to, to make it more responsive to the new financial landscape. Uh, they had to you know, introduce risk management uh, to the banks. Uh, and at the same time, they established a higher car ratio and much more uh, uh, greater supervision of, of, the, of the banking sector. So they move away from just a regulatory compliance towards a more active uh, uh, supervisory uh, approach to regulating the financial institution. <clears throat> and it's, so as a result of all the reforms that they, they took, uh, growth recovered, as I said, uh, as I mentioned, 
to about 5 to 6%. Uh, and they managed to repair the balance sheets of the corporate and restore the health of the, uh, the, of the corporate sector and the banking sector. And, you know, which then allowed, you know, financial intermediation to come back and that helps the, the economy to recover. Uh, uh, they deleverage and they rebuild the fiscal space. And also the, the exchange rate, I think I showed you know, earlier, uh, turned from a deficit to a surplus and they were able to build up a quite significant foreign exchange reserve. So that's at the uh, national level. At the regional level, I think many of the countries realize that uh, you know, they, 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 they need to establish the, the regional liquidity facility in order to, as a buffer against the shocks. During the Asian financial crisis, uh, most of the program were augmented by you know, support from uh, the neighboring countries. And this was mostly in the form of bilateral swaps between the central bank. So what they decided was, you know, uh, to establish a network of uh, bilateral swap between central bank. And that's what they call the Chama Initiative uh, around two, 2000. Uh, typically these are bilateral swaps between Japan and the ASEAN countries, and also between uh, you know, basically the plus three countries and the ASEAN countries. Uh, and the bilateral swap is in the form of, uh, in the case of Japan, US dollar uh, 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 swap against the local currency. <clears throat> then after the global financial crisis, uh, they decided to, you know, to consolidate the bilateral swap into a multilateralize it, you know, and and set it up as a common facility for all the members uh, and they based on, on the quota, depending on the contribution towards the facility. And the size of the, of the CMIM at that time was 120 billion. Uh, this, when it was set up in 2010. In 2014, they doubled the size of the facility, 240 billion. And they also introduced a new facility called the precautionary line of credit. So this is a preventive uh, line of credit, similar to, what in the IMF, the PLL and the, and the FCL, which is a flexible line of credit from the IMF to the member countries for those member countries that are strong performer so that you know they have a line of credit from the IMF and they can draw down anytime they want. Uh, but they have to, in order to be eligible for that, they have to prove that they are sound and have strong fundamentals. So similarly, the uh, the CMIM, uh, they set up a facility similar to that called the CMIM PL. Uh, and this was to allow members to, to draw on the facility before they get hit by any shocks. You know? um, and th at the same time, the delim portion of the facility you know, used to be 10%. So that anything beyond 10% needs to be have a program the IMF. That portion was increased gradually over time to 40%. So now, for instance, if, a, if a, uh, one of the big uh, emerging markets, say Thailand or Philippines, wants to borrow from the CMI MPL, they can borrow up to 40% without an IMF program. And that you know, is about 11, 12 billion US dollars. The total amount for each of the countries, about $23 billion each. Uh, so th those are the, the major ASEAN countries. Then for the smaller ones, the CMLV, uh, the, the quota is smaller. And so the, the, the amount that they can borrow is also smaller. Mm. At the same time, uh, it, because of moral hazard concern, they set up the economic review and policy dialogue uh, process in order to conduct peer review of each other. Uh, I mean, they come to realize that, you know, you are linked to your neighbors, whether you like it or not. And if there's problem, <laughs> In your neighbor, it could you know easily spill over to the economy. So the idea is to set up a, a, a review and policy dialogue process to make sure that you know the the neighbors are you know uh, disciplined in terms of that uh, and uh, following sound policies. So that was the genesis for the establishment of MRO uh, in 2011. 
Uh, in 2011, MRO was set up as a regional surveillance arm for the CMIM to provide the analytical and policy support uh, if there's a call on, on the CMIM because needs to make sure that you know the member that's borrowing from the CMIM is uh, is sound and is able to repay the the loan what the loans are relatively short term uh, they have to be you know six months and can be rolled over uh, but they are you know so for that reason uh, the the creditor countries also want to make sure that the the ones who are borrowing are, are, are following relatively sound policy. So EMRO was set up as the surveillance arm to provide that support to CMIM. Uh, and in February of uh, 2016, EMRO was uh, you know, uh, converted into an international organization. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, the, the region also uh, launched uh, the Asian Bond Markets Initiative. There was a, a view at the time of the crisis that the region is too dependent on banking, uh, bank land borrowing, and they need to set up a uh, you know, bond market to provide a second pillar, so for you know, in terms of financing for the uh, economy. So that was uh, set up uh, back in 2003, and it's been very successful. Uh, you know, the bond market uh, development in the region, I think, it's probably uh, more advanced than most other uh, developing countries. So this is a timeline of the uh, regional financial cooperation. Uh, so, you know, it basically traces the development of the CMIM initiative. As you can see, the crisis happened then. And then back in May 2000, the CMIM initiative was established. Uh, and then it, it became multilateralized in 2000, agreed to be multilateralized in 2007 but was actually set up only in 2010, you know, with $120 billion uh, after the global financial crisis. Uh, and then it was expanded to $240 billion in 2014. Uh, and recently, you know, they amended the, the agreement, uh, <clears throat> the, the CMIM agreement to increase the dealing portion from 30 to 40%. Uh, and EMRO was set up in 2011 and became an international organization, you know, uh, in 2016. Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, basically a chart of, of the bilateral swap between uh, you know, uh, the members in the region. And most of the swap is basically between the plus three countries and the ASEAN countries, uh, as you can see from here. Um, I mean, I think this can go further back, but, you know, so... In the, in the case of Japan, the JMOF is the one which, which is the, uh, the counterpart and also BOJ to some, uh, for some of them. <clears throat> so this chart basically shows the, uh, uh, the, what we call the global financial safety net. The first line of defense is the, uh, the national reserve. You know, when you get hit by a shock, you use your, your own reserve as, you know, as a buffer either to intervene, you know, uh, to mitigate the shocks. And the second level is uh, the CMI, the bilateral swap agreement uh, that was set up uh, under the CMI initiative. And then we have the regional uh, safety net, the multilateralized uh, CMI initiative. So this is a, a sort of a, a regional facility, you know, that's available to the members. And finally, at the outer ring is the uh, IMF resources. So, so in terms of, uh, <clears throat> of access, you use your own reserve first, and then you 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 draw on the on the national on the regional safety net before you 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 approach the IMF. So th this is these are the uh, amount, the, the size of the various facility. Uh, the IMF is the, the dark blue line here, and you can see that they are about the same size, uh, each of them amounting to about $14 trillion in total. This is for the, for, for the world, not, not just for the region. On the other hand, the first line of defense, which is the, uh, the own reserve, that amounts to about you know, uh, $40 trillion now. Uh, the region, as you know, is one of the, uh, has hold one of the highest level reserve uh, among all the other countries in the, 
Yeah, at the, so that's at the regional level, at the international level, uh, the, the AFC was also a shock to the international community. And they realized that they need to do something to, you know, to strengthen the, the international monetary system, the surveillance framework, and the international financial architecture. So a series of, of reform were, were taken at that time. Uh, in, in the Financial Stability Forum uh, and, the group, and the G20 were set up in uh, 1999, basically, uh, because they recognized that the, uh, the financial uh, regulatory framework was relatively uh, inadequate uh, red, you know, and it needed to be strengthened. So the Financial Stability Forum was set up to review the, the, the regulatory framework and, 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 and make recommendations on how it can be improved. Uh. Similarly, for the G20 was set up at around the same time because uh, the, the US and, and, and G7 countries realized that the, a lot of the shots were hitting developing countries uh, and it was affecting you know, the, their own financial institution as well. And so they, they need to uh, bring in the big developing countries, you know, to discuss policies and, and regulatory uh, issues. So the G20 was, was set up at, at about the same time uh, to facilitate, to be more inclusive and to facilitate that policy dialogue and agree on, on policies that affect the, the global economy. <clears throat> the G and then during the Asian, the global financial crisis, the, the, the Financial Stability Forum was elevated to become the Financial Stability Board. Uh, so initially it was set up at the deputies level. And so they, they decided to elevate it to the Financial Stability Board and, and, and it was represented at the governance level. Uh, and it also was broadened to include all the G20 members uh, yeah, as well. The G20, on the other hand, was elevated to a leaders' summit uh, because of the global financial crisis. They needed to, uh, you know, coordinate policies in order to uh, to support the global economy, which was uh, so. That was a time when, you know, for the first time, there was a coordinated uh, 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 fiscal pump priming, uh, which helped to, you know, support the the global economy and prevent it from crashing. <clears throat> The IMF also recognized that you know this surveillance framework has become inadequate, and they needed to uh, reform the surveillance uh, framework. And that was the time when they realized that they didn't fully understand the market, and the capital international capital markets was set up at, the, at that time. Uh, you know, and they hired a lot of uh, financial specialists in order to you know, try to uh, get a better handle on on financial flows. The financial market has basically become a, a major player in terms of policy uh, because of the uh, you know the volatility of capital flows. Uh, at the same time, uh, they also introduce what they call the FSEP, uh, the Financial Sector Assessment Process, and there are several modules to the FSEP. Uh, we call the score ROS. Uh, uh, basically, these are best practices in terms of uh, regulatory. Uh, 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 regime. So they have uh, roles for banking, for instance, uh, you know, the Basel uh, principle one and two, uh, and, and now it's, uh, it's three. Uh, so what they do is, you know, they will send peer regulators into a country to assess the, the regulatory regime in that particular country and see whether it's up to best international practice. As, as the, you know. uh, so a lot of these reforms you know, were, were done in order to strengthen the, the robustness of the international financial system. <clears throat> there was also an issue with uh, capital control, uh, and, but this only came much later because uh, initially uh, around the time of the crisis, you know, they were actually moved to try to change the IMF uh, charter to allow it, uh, uh, you know, uh, mandate to include uh, uh, authority over capital measures, capital control. But because of the Asian financial crisis, you know, that 
that particular move didn't go through. But in any case, uh, you know, they, everyone realized that capital uh, flows was, was a big issue, especially volatile, volatility of capital flows. And so in 2016, they finally came around to review you know, the policy on capital flows and came up with a set of measures uh, called the capital flow uh, measures uh, institutional view on how and when capital flow measures can be taken and under what condition. Uh, I think the, the, the view from the region is still that it's still pretty timid. Uh, that it doesn't go far enough to address the, the concern of the region. Uh, because the view is that you can in, introduce capital measures, but it has to be temporary and has to be withdrawn once the situation changes. Uh, so that was a, a, a problem is, and it's still an ongoing issue for many countries in the region. So this is the, a timeline on the evolution of the FSF and G20, uh, you know, I, you know, started in basically established in 2019. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and it's now elevated to G20 summit level, leaders level, and also the FSB. So basically, I'll uh, come to the end of my presentation. I thought I'd just uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the, the new shock that uh, took place uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, I think the pandemic uh, is a totally different type of crisis. Uh, it's not a financial crisis, uh, it's a health crisis. But the measures that were taken to contain the crisis, you know, was a shock to the system in, on, on, in terms of the finance because it locked down the economy, it disrupted production, it disrupted income, and there's a liquidity uh, a crisis. And economies in the region had to, you know, uh, take very expansionary uh, fiscal monetary uh, measures in order to support the economy. Uh, so fortunately for the region, uh, because of the reforms they've been implementing over the last uh, 20 years, uh, they were in a relatively uh, good position when the crisis hit to support the economy. They were able to ramp up the, the, the fiscal uh, uh, policy and also ease monetary policy and, you know, and regul for regulatory uh, measures in order to support the economy. And so in the last two years, uh, despite the, the crisis, you know, um, they, there has been no financial crisis in the region. Uh, and in fact, the external position strengthened in the last two years. Uh, uh, there's been a build up in, in the debt, uh, at, especially in the uh, public debt, the government debt, but also uh, for some countries, in the, the corporate and, and the household debt has, has increased. So the, the, the risk going forward is, you know, how, to, how do you sort of exit from this uh, highly expansionary uh, uh, stimulus package without, you know, causing the economy or supporting the economy in, in the recovery? Uh, and again, I think here the region is doing relatively well. Uh, so the, the measures that were taken back in, you know, to deal with this uh, capital flow uh, crisis have, have have served the region well in terms of uh, supporting the economy during the pandemic. Mm. But of course, going forward, we are now faced with new crises, uh, new challenges, um, or new risks and challenges uh, so, so coming from the, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, basically coming from you know, climate change, uh, you know, maybe new, new pandemics uh, and the, supply chain issues. Uh, and the question is whether they, we need to make further changes or reform to, to our monetary policy uh, or policy and regulatory framework in order to deal with the new challenges. Uh, the new challenges like climate change actually requires collective action, unfortunately. And this is uh, unfortunately uh, a bit short uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, you know, this, I think these are the new challenges that face the region. And, you know, within EMRO, uh, we've been, we are now reviewing our facilities as well as our mandate in order to see how we can uh, rise up to the new challenge, uh, to meet the new challenges. So let me stop here. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. This was fascinating and interesting. And I, 
I do apologize for not making the advertisement for the book ahead of your talk, uh, but uh, do realize that this book is also online as a PDF, so you can access it for free. And I encourage many people to read it because it is absolutely a fascinating account of an analytical analytical account of uh, what happened, but also uh, a personal account of many of the players that were involved. Some of the players that were involved are actually online, and I'm sure some of them will call on you in, in due course. But let me let me start, and it's actually inspired by a question by uh, uh, Mr. Shu Sotao. Uh, uh, do a little bit of, as they call it in, in the United States, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, because a lot has happened uh, during after the financial crisis, and, and by and large, the region came out really well. But there still seems to be a lot of talk about what could have been done differently when the crisis happened. And, and uh, talk about Thailand, uh, the package for Thailand with massive reforms in the financial sector up front, all the closing, uh, closing of many of the finance companies, uh, the, the famous or infamous structural commissionalities on, on uh, Indonesia, uh, when uh, uh, Suharto signed this letter of intent in January 1998, uh, uh, from a 25-year rear view mirror, would you say that things could have gone differently if there would have been different treatment of that crisis? Uh, yes, I, I think it could have been different uh, with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in, at the time of the crisis, the, the the IMF, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, uh, did a bit of soul searching after the crisis and realized that it was actually, uh, you know, uh, inadequate in terms of uh, the tools and the framework it had to deal with the crisis. Uh, so he applied the traditional medicine, which is to tighten your belt, you know, raising tighten policy in order to, you know, uh, to, to try to, to uh, defend the exchange rate uh, you know, and, and turn the current account positive. This, this, this was applied, I think, in Latin America, uh, but the crisis in Latin America was quite different because uh, you know, they were suffering mostly from a current account uh, uh, deficit crisis. Whereas in the case of uh, uh, the Asian economy, much of the debt was uh, by the corporate sector, you know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the fiscal account was relatively strong, you know, uh, uh, positive. Uh, so applying the, that same medicine to Asian economy was definitely, uh, you know, in, in improper or you know, inappropriate. And I think that was realized subsequently. Uh, so as you can see from the uh, COVID pandemic, right, uh, the response was so different, you know. I mean, immediately everyone re recognized the need to be to, to take very expansionary uh, fiscal and monetary policies to support the economy, right? Of course, there's a, there's a concern that exposed you're going to have a problem because you know that that is going to go up and that may, may create a, and it has created a crisis for some some countries. But because the reason was relatively well you know a position, uh, it was able to do all this without suffering a crisis. So, I think. In retrospect, in the case of Thailand, in, at least, I think it could have been managed uh, if they had had the foresight and they deal with the financial uh, distress in the banking, in the uh, corporate sector, especially the finance company, the property company and all that, and try to get them to deleverage. I think it's possible that they could have had a, a smoother transition, huh? but, uh, you know, but that was not the case, unfortunately. And because of the, the speculative attack, it triggered the hurt, hurting behavior and a massive, uh, you know, uh, sellout on, on, on the currency. Uh, and that makes the whole situation. So in the dynamics of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole thing was very different. And in the case of Indonesia, I think it was a political crisis, you know, and that's not easy to, <laughs> for, to foresee. But Indonesia was doing very well. If you look at the IMF report, uh, you know, in 1996, uh, it was held up as a as a, as a model economy. You know, uh, uh, they were following. They had a, a sort of a, a crawling pack system, and it was working very well uh, until the the crisis broke in in Thailand, and then it came under attack. And after a while, they couldn't uh, sustain it any 
meeting any any longer and had to call in the IMF, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was very painful, very traumatic, and maybe a bit of it was, you know, it could have been handled better. <clears throat> um, on that same theme, sorry to dwell, but uh, there were two moments, actually, there were during the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF in Hong Kong. There was a proposal already of an Asia monetary fund at that time, proposed by Japan. I mean, it was not formally proposed, but discussed, and uh, that was heavily criticized. Yes. The, the, the second, and, and it would have been perfectly useful, frankly, at that time. The second was the controversy around capital controls. Indeed, the IMF, 10 years after the fact, came to a different position. You mentioned it uh, for many uh, Asian countries, maybe not yet flexible enough. But I recall the uh, enormous criticism that the Malaysian government uh, came under after basically imposing capital controls because they, they, they had run out of reserves. Uh, why were these two things so controversial at the time? Well, in the case of the Asian Monetary Fund, uh, we know that Mr. Yen, <laughs> Sakaki Barasan, uh, came around, I think he came to Singapore and we met, you know, uh, when he made the proposal to set up the fund. And we were very supportive of that uh, at, at, at the time. We thought it was a great idea. Because from their viewpoint and from our perspective, the region was doing very well. And we, in, in our view, this it was mainly due to the speculators that, you know, that triggered the, the attack. So it was a technical issue. It wasn't a fundamental issue. You know? uh, so we felt that a fund like this would be able to beat back the speculators. You know, if they're big enough, you can defend the currency and that would you know, uh, help avoid a crisis. Uh, unfortunately, I think the view of the, the US and the IMF was it was a moral hazard problem, you know, that this would be something that countries with fundamental problem were used, you know, uh, because it's cheap money, it's easy, uh, easy quick disbursement, uh, even when they have you know, bigger problem. So, I, so because of that, uh, you know, the, 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 the proposal was shot down uh, and didn't take off. But as I mentioned, uh, subsequently what happened is, you know, they set up this bilateral swap arrangement and then over time multilateralize it. So, if you take the AMRO together, CMIM is the equivalent of the Asian Monetary Fund that was proposed by Japan to some extent, you know, um, but with conditionality as well. Uh, now, you know, the, under the new facility, uh, this, the, the, the economy has to be uh, proved prove that it's actually uh, pursuing sound policy. Uh, so that addresses the moral hazard issue that was raised by the IMF and, and, and the uh, uh, US. Um, on the second point, uh, issue about the capital control, you know, I mean, we know that the IMF was ready to, you know, propose a change in the mandate of the of the IMF in order to, you know, uh, encourage countries to open up the capital account, right? So capital control is just the opposite of <laughs> what the, they they were about to do, uh, and they were not convinced that it would help, uh, you know, uh, address this, the situation. And, and indeed for many, some of the countries, in, it worked for Malaysia, as it turns out, you know, because Malaysia had relatively uh, strong administrative capability and regulatory. You know. But for some of the countries, uh, even if they had in, in, uh, adopted it, it probably would not have worked uh, because it's very hard to, to uh, 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 implement a, a scheme like this. Uh. Uh, of capital control, but the Malaysian uh, did it, uh, you know, and they were quite successful in in in, in that, and it gave them the, the space they needed in order to you know repair the economy. Uh, because of that, they didn't have, they are able to set exchange the interest rate, and the the big fight between the IMF and Malaysia was over the interest rate. How they wanted Malaysia to raise interest rate, and Malaysia know that. If interest rate were to go up too high, it's going to kill the corporate sector. You know? And so by, by, by imposing capital control, they are able to you know, have an independent uh, interest rate policy. <clears throat> so that, but I think in retrospect, 
the IMF also recognized that you know Malaysia has a point <laughs> and it's, it's more flexible now. Uh, you know, and you know, not that the IMF would adopt capital control, but you know, it's, it's more understanding and it's amending its, uh, its institutional view uh, to, uh, to be more flexible on, on, on this. Um, during the time, actually, I mean, that's why I thought the Asia Monetary Fund, in a way, was in principle a good, a good, a good agreement. Uh, not least because a lot of the regional policymakers did add on to the IMF uh, packages. Uh, so there was, including Singapore, that gave that gave money for, I believe, Thailand and Indonesia. Um, um, so it would have been maybe a good arrangement. But uh, anyway, in the end. We got the, the Chiang Mai initiative, and, and now we have that. But Dr. Kun Go has a, a question on that. And he says, are, is the region now really overinsured? If you look at all these facilities and enormous amounts of international reserves, uh, has the reaction to the Asia financial crisis been an overreaction? Is there now too much international reserves? And mind you, they're not, they're not without their opportunity costs. Well, in in some countries are overinsured, I would say, yeah. And reserves are not cheap. So actually it's not been very, uh, you know, uh, cheap to build up self insurance. But the nature of insurance is that you can get hit by a shock, which may never happen. And the more insurance you have, the less likely it is to happen, right? Uh, but the cost of, of building up the reserve and you know, self insurance is that, in, you know, is that you ended up with uh, using a lot of your savings, which could have gone into investment in building up the reserve, right? And as a result, actually, some of the countries in the region, you know, uh, were, didn't invest enough in infrastructure, you know, and that leads to you know a, a reduction in the growth rate. So there was a, a cost involved in terms of uh, not just the, the cost of the investment investing in reserve. But of course, in terms of higher growth rate, potential growth rate, you know, and I think some countries in the region are now trying to catch up. Uh, Indonesia, Philippines, for instance, uh, in terms of trying to, you know, uh, invest in infrastructure to build up the capacity for growth. Uh, so yeah, so I, you know, as long as we have this uh, floating exchange rate system with the U.S. dollar as a dominant, you're going to have this wave of, uh, you know. Uh, financial cycle, which can hit the emerging markets. I mean, it just happened uh, when the U.S. Fed uh, raised interest rate, uh, but it didn't hit the region that badly because you know the region was strong. So the speculators or investors know that you know uh, the, the fundamentals are strong. But uh, this is the kind of shot that we're going to continue to have to uh, manage uh, as long as uh, you know the internet. The, the international monetary system is anchored around the U.S. dollar and floating exchange rates. <clears throat> yeah, some some would like to see that differently, but we might come to that. Uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Quack, who used to be at the ADB at the time, uh, has a comment on that, and I'll just read uh, uh, paraphrase the comment. He basically said, "Look, uh, yes, there was lots of uh, uh, the flexible flexible exchange rate system after the collapse of the Bretton Woods was there, but of course." The regional currencies or the, the, re, the age of financial crisis basically happened because those countries had not adjusted their currency system. They had not gone to a float. Yes, there was a managed float and uh, uh, in, in, in Indonesia, a fairly flexible one. But in the end, it was uh, opening up capital account channels, not fully all of them, but capital account channels combined with a fixed exchange rate that led to probably uh, a, a vulnerability that could not be managed in in the prevailing system, and I think I think that's a that's a fair that's a fair comment uh, at, at this mm -hmm. at this point. Um, the uh, question uh, there's two questions from Dr. Chang Gang and uh, uh, Clarence Lee, basically the same type of question. But uh, now that we are in 2022, um, we see another major turn in monetary policy happening, especially in the United States. Uh, the EU is still talking about it because they have some other problems on their hands. Uh, but but uh, uh, before the Asia financial crisis, there was the Mexican financial crisis, yeah. uh, which was basically triggered by a major change in monetary policy in the United States. And the knock-on effect was 
there's a lot of capital flowed to Asia and then and then came back and stopped. Now today, uh, for the region but also for the world, uh, there's another adjustment in this monetary policy. We have a strong dollar. Uh, a lot of debt is still in dollars for emerging markets. Are we again at risk for another round of crisis to happen? I I would say not. Uh, you know, and and the reason is uh, if you look at the uh, interest rate in the region, the, especially the long end, uh, it has gone up because uh, you know the U.S. rate has gone up and it sort of pulled everything up. But it went down uh, quite quite significantly before that. So now it's sort of reverting back to where it was before the crisis. Uh, but more important, I think, is that the, uh, the I, as I mentioned, the external position has actually strengthened in the last two years, and many of them have accumulated uh, uh, reserve. You know? And so they are in a much stronger position to, to buffer the, the shocks uh, than, than before. Uh, the debt has, has gone up, uh, and, but much of the debt in the region is domestic uh, currency debt. You know? uh, because of the collapse in domestic demand, financial savings went up very sharply. And so a lot of the fiscal deficit has been financed by drawing down, drawing on financial savings, domestic financial savings, rather than external borrowing. So some of the countries were concerned that they might, you know, because of the, of the uh, risk aversion that there will be kept outflow and the issue uh, global bonds, uh, in foreign currency. And most of that uh, bor borrowed uh, funds ended up as a reserve in, in the central bank. Uh, so this, that's why the, the central bank accumulated more reserve on top of the current account surplus that, that they, you know, uh, which also you know, led, lead to the accumulation of surplus, especially in, in, in the case of the Philippines, you know, the, the surplus went, the current account went from a deficit to a big surplus. And on top of that, they had a, a lot of these uh, global bonds that added to the reserve. <clears throat> so I, I think the risk is quite small, in my view, uh, that there'll be another uh, big shock in the region. Uh, and you know, for, for the other countries in the region, like you know, Thailand, they're just swimming in reserve, so there, there's there's really no risk of, of, of balance of payment crisis at all. <clears throat> Some of, I mean, you you noted the success of the of the establishment of the regional bond market or the local bond market, the local currency bond markets, I should say. Yeah. At the same time, I think uh, we have become aware of increased risk even there because. Uh, for some countries, there's a large share of the bonds are being bought by foreigners who might still sell and might still put pressure on the mm -hmm. current. How, how do you see that risk at, at, at the current stage in, uh, in East Asia? Yeah, that, you know, that was <laughs> uh, uh, a concern at, or, you know, a, or disappointment that many of the policymakers have uh, because they were told that if they were to develop a domestic currency bond market, right, you give them greater uh, uh, protection against uh, what they call the original sin problem, which is a mismatch in currency, right? But as it turns out, if the, for if the foreign investors were to buy a local currency bond and sell, they want to withdraw the money in foreign exchange, right? So it comes back to, again, to hit them, uh, uh, and, and didn't really go away. And we saw that during the taper tantrum, you know? Uh, so if you have, if, you're, if the foreign holdings of your local currency bond is high, then you're actually vulnerable to this uh, shock of an outflow, right? Uh, but as it turns out, uh, you know, at the moment, in the last two years, the foreign currency holding of local currency bond has gone down. Uh, partly because, you know, when, when the crisis first hit in 2020, there was a, a big outflow. You know, and then there were very little inflows after that. You know. So relative to the total stock of debt, which you know, a, a lot of the increase was from domestic investors, the, the share of the foreign currency has gone down quite significantly. And relative to the increase in the reserve holding is much smaller now. So because of that, you know, I, I think that the region is much more you know, resilient to this kind of shocks. Um, there's one, one potential cause of the Asia financial crisis that you haven't discussed yet, and it was discussed at the time. Um, and I'd like to 
put the question because it might be relevant for today. That was namely the, the, the depreciation of the uh, uh, yen, the Japanese yen in the mid 90s. And the thinking was that actually uh, there was increased competition from Japan. And mind you, China also had depreciated in 1994 quite, quite uh, drastically uh, with its unification of the exchange rate. Uh, the thinking was that had knock-on effects on the export performance of the, East, the Southeast yeah. Asian countries. And as uh, in reaction, there has been more, the, the, basically the policy reaction was lending more capital to have more domestically led growth. Now we still, we again see quite a bit of changes in uh, the relative exchange rates. Uh, the yen is again very weak. Uh, but also the uh, uh, RMB has been weakening over over time. Is that is that a risk for the region, or have things changed so much that it's no longer relevant? And also, what was your thinking on this uh, this co potential cause of the financial crisis? No, as you, as you mentioned, uh, the RMB depreciated very sharply in '94, right, because of the uh, very high inflation, uh, and there was a big uh, uh, black market, the RMB went to over 10 RMB, you know, uh, RMB per dollar, and then they subsequently stabilized it 8.6, you know, uh, and since then it's been appreciating. So when the crisis hit, it was around 8.6, I, I think, or, or that level, 8.2, okay. It was already depreciated from where it was in 1993 and 94, you know. And they decided to hold it then. I think that was very helpful. But the, I think that in terms of uh, valuation, the, 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 the RMB was relatively uh, competitive already. And there was no reason for, you know, for the central bank to depreciate it further. You know? So it was very helpful. If they had depreciated, it would have probably caused you know, a bit of a, 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 a concern in the region. Uh, and in, in the case of the yen, the yen was under tremendous pressure <laughs> at, at that time, uh, went down to 140 something. Uh, but as, as I mentioned, I, I think that the, 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 the attack on the local currency, right, was triggered not because of, the, of what happened outside the region, but what happened within the region, you know, and it was triggered by the hedge funds and circulated attack on, on, the, on the Thai bar, okay. And so I think regardless of where the yen was, it would have happened huh? uh, because they, they saw vulnerabilities in, in, in Thailand because of the, of the massive borrowing from abroad. They had the BIBF uh, window you know, to borrow short term and lend to the developers. You know? uh, so I, I think that would have happened. What, what I think was different was that in, in, because of the problem of the yen, right? Uh, there was a massive withdrawal of Japanese funds from the region after the crisis happened. Okay, and that I think was not helpful in, in a sense in terms of the you know the recovery of the region. Uh, so that was when I think a lot of the the the, the, the banks from Europe came in. You know, uh, uh, so there was a, a, a sort of a, a shift in in terms of funding uh, from from Japan to to to, to Europe and and the US. Uh, uh, although after the the global financial crisis, it reverses again. You know, the European basically pulled back uh, very sharply from the region, and the Japanese came in. <laughs> no. So there are this flow of funds at the international level, you know. Uh, but I, I I think it it didn't really affect the, uh, the the crisis in the sense that I don't think it was a trigger. You know, uh, it may not have been very helpful in terms of the recovery of the of the region. <laughs> And now, of course, we have something in a way similar because the yen is under pressure, huh? but, and, and that's mostly because of the uh, the yield curve control, and it's very technical because you know the the US dollar uh, the gap, I mean the, the spread between US dollar interest rate and Japanese has been widening, and you know that's pushing down the, the yen. Huh? Uh, and but again, you know, I I, I think. The driver for most of the currency in the region is the US dollar and not so much the yen. You know, uh, the yen, will, of course, you know, a lot of people expected that the yen would benefit from safe current uh, haven flow, and that has not happened. You know? 
And on balance, you know, I think it's still open question whether the weaker yen is uh, a plus or negative for the for the Japanese. I mean, traditionally, it's, it's been a, a, a weak yen has been good for the Japanese economy. Uh, but you know, but I think the, the the views are changing, and people are thinking that a very weak yen actually leads to high inflation and higher costs, which cannot be passed on because of the deflationary environment, and therefore it's been a drag on the economy rather than a, a, a boost. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. This was a very interesting lecture, very fascinating topic, and I thank you for your frank and open answers in the uh, in the discussion. I thank everybody for coming to the lecture. We had a, a wonderful attendance of 100, over 130 people, and most of you stayed. That is always my quality indicator. So thank you so much for spending some time with us uh, in our East Asian Distinguished Lecture uh, today. Uh, once again, Dr. Kaur, thank you so much, and goodbye to everybody. Thank you, Bert. Uh, and uh, once again, just, just to mention that the book is available for download from our website. So feel free to do it. <laughs> Please Thank do you. it. It's a fascinating read. I can recommend it to everybody in this Zoom because everybody is interested in that topic. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Bert.